Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Public Allies. I'm your host for today's webinar. My name is Aisha Sardar, and we are so happy to again have you on Public Allies. With us today, we have our very own real estate expert, Swapna Chari. She is going to be talking about the D's of real estate. Yes. You heard it right. Even I don't know what those Ds are, so I'm waiting to hear from her. But before we start, I wanted to introduce her. Swapna is a real estate broker with Home Life Galaxy and runs her own team called Swap Team. She's been in the real estate business for more than 11 years. She's been the office manager and worked at various capabilities in the real estate offices and is very knowledgeable about the real estate market rules and regulations. You can reach her at any time with your questions at 416-888-9492. All her information is already there, so you can contact her. Welcome, Swapna. Thank you. Thanks, Aisha. Thanks to Public Allies for uh, once again giving me an opportunity to um, uh, show my knowledge at this platform to uh, exchange some information. Um, once again, today we will be discussing about some very, very important topics in real estate. These are not topics we discuss on a daily basis, but it's uh, something very important that um, we should know what to do, right? Um, these are the, 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 the Ds of real estate. We are going to talk about different um, as the not so good aspects of uh, real estate because buying and selling is not always about only the happy times. There are certain times when you need to buy and sell for different reasons. Um, so I just want to reveal what those Ds are, which we normally don't think about. We normally don't discuss in our everyday life, but it is very, very important. Um, one thing that is I wouldn't say it's 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 a very happy thing. One is downsizing. We are going to talk about what happens when when a couple is downsizing from their existing home. We are going to talk about debts. When someone is in debt, what happens to their property? How do you handle debts? We are going to talk about divorce. Again, it's not something uh, you expect to happen or it's not something uh, uh, that is a happy thing to happen. But if it happens, how do you handle it? What happens to uh, the real estate side when, uh, when you're going through a divorce? Disasters. Again, disasters can be of different kinds. COVID was a disaster, right? Um, is a disaster, uh, Swapna, I would say. <laughs> yes, it is a disaster, but I'm sure a lot of people... Um, we're, we're not in mortgage default because of things that the government provided for us. Uh, there, there was mortgage relief for a few months, right? Those are things that helped us when there was a disaster. Now, that was like a universal disaster, right? But yeah. there are certain other disasters that happen because of man-made things or because of natural things. So we're mm -hmm. going to talk about those disasters. Um, we're going to talk about default. There are some people who lost their jobs. There are some other things that happened in their life and they missed mortgage payments. So what happens to properties when there is a default in mortgage? The other thing, the last thing, which is not a very pleasant thing, uh, none of us like to talk about it, but it's a very, very important thing, uh, which is death, right? Uh, death is not something uh, that is a question mark. Will it happen? It's going to it's happen. It's inevitable, to, right? Yes. Yeah. It's something that will happen to each one of us. The only thing we don't know is what date and time it's going to happen, but you need to be prepared for it in case it happens, right? So yeah. everything that you have earned or you have worked hard all your life does not go waste when you're dead. Right. Yeah. So we are going to talk about these Ds. I know they are not very pleasant Ds. They are not those happy sounding Ds, uh, but they are all very important Ds uh, because when things happen, you cannot run at the last moment uh, wondering what you need to do next. Right. So, yeah. so it's better for us to have at least some idea. Um, yeah. Again, the things that we will be discussing in these Ds are not specific to your situation, not specific to anybody's situation. This is going to be a very generalized discussion. If you have a specific situation that you would like to discuss and you cannot discuss it on this platform or you do not want to talk about it, you can always
always feel free to give me a call. I can um, I can direct you to the right lawyer or direct you to the right concerned party who can help you with that. If it's not me who can help you in the real estate side, because we do have other services that we work with, I can at least direct you to the right person, right? So yeah. let's start about... Um, the first D, I didn't want to start with death in the beginning, yeah. beginning itself. At the so, presentation, right? Yes. Yeah. But I want to add one thing uh, sure. to what you said. Although these are not the Ds we talk about, but like you said, they, we do come across them. Yes. So it is better to have an education mm -hmm. and, you, and you take an educated view towards it. You take an educated decision when you are dealing with it. So yeah. what you're doing here, you're preparing people for what could come, what could not come probably. We hope it doesn't happen in your lives. But then if it does, you know what to be done. So How to deal with it. Yeah, because I, we, I have seen a lot of um, couples where uh, one spouse is gone and they don't know how to deal with the property, right? So at least you should have a bare minimum idea of what to do next. Right. So let's begin with uh, downsizing. I think it's a it's a very big D that a uh, lot of people do not discuss, but that is something that um, we all come across at some point of life. Uh, what is downsizing? Basically, um, Aisha, can you move to the next slide, please? Yes. So basically, downsizing is moving from a bigger house to smaller house. Right. That's what downsizing means, and often it happens. Um, in couples that who are getting older, um, they're called empty nesters. Uh, the 4,000 or the 3,500 square feet house with four bedrooms and six washrooms feels too big right now for them because there is nobody in the house other than the old couple, right? Um, so it becomes hard for them to manage many things like keeping the house clean, uh, cleaning the backyard or cleaning all the rooms in the house um, or, or even including the cost that they need to bear to hold on to the house, right? So normally that's when people think about downsizing. Um, again, I have helped a lot of old couples to downsize it's not a very pleasant thing. It's not a very happy thing. Uh, there is a lot of ups and downs and lots of emotions that we face along with them when somebody is downsizing. Um, over to the next slide, please. So what are the advantages of downsizing? Why do people even consider downsizing? One is because the entire mortgage can be paid off, right? Right now with the house prices being so high, I see a lot of couples uh, who, who want to downsize, they pay off their entire uh, mortgage and then they have some equity on their hand. They move into something smaller that requires very less maintenance. Their bills are very low. And they get more time to do the things that they really love to do. Maybe spend time together, go out for walks together, go out for a breakfast together. Instead of sitting and cleaning the house or worrying about the upkeep of the house, they, they get more time um, to spend with each other. So that's one of the main reasons that people consider downsizing. Um, I would basically, in easier terms, just say that it's like an exercise to save both money and time. Why do some people don't downsize? Like why some people think of not downsizing? Uh, a lot of times I have seen couples who have lived in big houses. For them, it's like a prestige issue. What will my relatives think about me? Or what will my neighbor think about me? I lived in such a big house and now I have to downgrade myself, right? So some people do not like downsizing for that reason because they feel somehow they're going to live below the um, below their standard of living and they, they do not want uh, their relatives or family to think bad about them. So that's one reason that people normally don't like the idea of downsizing. I recently worked with a couple that uh, is downsizing, right? Every house that I showed them, they felt was too small for them, which is normal in downsizing, right? You come from a bigger house and you show them a bungalow house or you show them a two bedroom condo, it's going to feel like a, like a miniature uh, space. It's not something that they are going to enjoy, but 
they need to do it for their own good. Um, <clears throat> the next thing is downsizing is a big lifestyle change, right? Not many people like those kind of lifestyle change, especially people don't like that word change. And at a certain age, they really don't like to change anything, right? They just want to leave life as the way it's going. So they become very resistant uh, to everything. Um, I have seen couples where they don't let me do staging, right? Because there is so much emotions attached with that house. You touch their couch, they're like, no, 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 don't touch that couch. I bought it in 1960. No, 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 don't touch my family pictures. Don't touch this, don't touch that. It's a lot of emotions. We do understand the kind of emotions. Everything you touch or you see, they have some memory attached to it, especially for people who have lived in houses for a very long time. Just to give you an example, there was a couple that I worked with who stayed in the same house for 25 years, right? So you can imagine the amount of stuff they have collected, the pictures on their walls, everything had memories to it, right? So it's a lot of uh, emotional up and down that needs to be handled when people are downsizing. It's not a very pleasant thing, but it's 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 something that is a must that they have to do to um, to, to put some money in their pocket, right? Um, again, downsizing is, is a little bit painful, but, but they have to do it. The next day we are going to discuss about, again, not a very pleasant one, not something that, um, that everybody goes through or needs to go through, but whoever is going through, it's, it's very painful. It's divorce. Um, divorce is actually... We all know what a divorce is. It's the ending of a relationship. Uh, Aisha, can you go to the next slide, please? So normally all relationships don't end in a very nice or in a mutual way. Um, normally when it's a divorce, there is a lot of tension, a lot of stress, a lot of um, extreme things that couples go through when there is a divorce. And many marriages don't end in a very amicable or in a very happy fashion. Um, so what happens to properties when you're going through divorce, right? Um, divorce is basically pretty much very energy draining and you're forced to figure out a lot of things like how to divide your assets, how to divide your properties. Uh, one thing I would like to mention um, in, in a divorce situation is there is a difference between a married couple and there is a difference between a common law, right? Uh, what's the difference between the two? A married couple is somebody who's legally married. They are recognized as being married uh, because they got married in front of some individuals. They got married in front of legal powers like the judge or maybe uh, somebody from a religious institution who has the power to declare that they are married. Uh, what's a common law? Whoever is living in Ontario for three years together is called um, a common law relationship. Um, marriage laws are applicable only for married people. The family law is applicable only for married people. It does not work in the same way for a common law. We are going to discuss about how uh, people separate when it's marriage and when it's common law. There is a term called matrimonial home, right? The term matrimonial home itself means it's a home that was um, th that was where the couple lived when they were married. They had kids, they had uh, a family life in that home, and it's called a matrimonial home. When it comes to a matrimonial home, both spouses have the same kind of interest, right? Whether, um, uh, whether it was rented out to somebody or whether they lived in the same house, the, the rights are same for both the spouses, even when they are going through a divorce. Go to the next slide, please. The next one. So here are uh, the next one as well. So here are some rules, right? What happens in divorce and what, what, what happens with the matrimonial home. Um, when you are going through divorce, first of all, one spouse cannot kick the other spouse out of the house saying this is my house or this is my house because both have equal rights to that house. Both will continue living in the same house till the house gets sold or the judge grants them right or, or the judge grants one of those spouses to move out of the house. Till then, that house belongs to both 
the spouses. And if one spouse decides to move out, the other spouse is not allowed to change locks or do anything, um, uh, anything that uh, prevents the other spouse from entering the house. Because till the house is sold, until uh, the, the uh, assets are divided, that house belongs to both parties. The next one, please. So uh, till, the, uh, till the house is sold, none of these parties have the right to either sublet any rooms or rent, uh, refinance the house, sell, do a mortgage, get a second mortgage or have a line of credit. Nothing happens without the other spouse's written permission, right? You need to get the other spouse's consent. Only then um, the other spouse can do whatever they want with the house. Um, and the decision to sell the house has to be made jointly by both spouses. When there is a disagreement, normally the matter goes to the court and the court is the one that decides. I have seen in many cases where there is disagreement between husband and wife and the husband has his own realtor and the wife has her own realtor. And now it's the realtor's uh, headache to figure out how to communicate between the two through these real estate agents. Um, so, so divorce can sometimes get like really, really complicated, especially um, when, when there is disagreement. The next thing we are going to discuss about is what is common law spouses. We discussed what a marriage is. A common law spouse is somebody that uh, has lived together in a relationship for three years. Common law spouses do not have equal rights like a married spouse. Uh, the house and the assets do not get divided into 50-50. Uh, they do not have automatic rights to the house or automatic rights to any assets. Um, the other thing that I would like to point out uh, during um, a divorce is um, uh, if you if you have anything such as parents gift like if the wife brings in any jewelry any gifts that comes into the house as a part of the marriage those things do not get divided uh, the the basic thing that happens during a divorce as per the family law in ontario is that um, all the assets get divided equally between both the spouses and both of them get a fresh start to the life at the same point, right? If, if husband gets 50,000, wife gets 50,000. If husband gets one car, the wife gets one car. So that's how both of them start their life at an equal pace. Um, it, they are not judged uh, low or high or based on anything. Right. Um, so this is how the family law works. And when it comes to matrimonial homes, they have clear cut rules and regulation on how matrimonial home works. Um, so if your house sells for a particular value, the real estate commission, everything gets um, paid out. The real estate commission remaining mortgage, everything gets paid out. And whatever money is left from the assets gets divided 50-50. That's how it works with matrimonial homes when you're going through a divorce. Again, it depends on case by case. If you have any questions in regards to this, you can give me a call and we can discuss more in detail. The next D that we are going to talk about is disaster. Uh, like we discussed, COVID was a disaster but we had a lot of help from the government, um, many mortgage lenders. In fact, every mortgage lender gave something called as a mortgage deferral, which was very nice. It, it was a big relief for a lot of people who lost their jobs and things, right? So that was uh, one part of the disaster did not happen because of anybody's mistake, but um, we all got to enjoy um, I would say enjoy the um, the opportunity of uh, mortgage deferral that was given to us, right? So disasters are of two kinds. One is man-made and one is natural. When it's a man-made disaster, it's like uh, fire, gas explosion. Um, I'm sure a lot of people must have read things about uh, houses getting burned down in fire, houses getting uh, burned down in gas explosion. Natural disasters are pretty much like flood, um, uh, there was something that happened a few years ago, I still remember a lot of uh, 
roof shingles flew away because of very uh, heavy wind. Those are the natural disasters. And most of them are covered by the insurance company if it is not your mistake, right? Um, one thing that I would, um, I would uh, stress here or point out here is you need to have a home insurance at all point of time. If you're a new first time home buyer, your house will not close without having a home insurance. Um, your lawyer will not close your property on the closing day without having a home insurance. In many cases, your home insurance can be clubbed in with your um, car insurance to get a package deal. Um, and I would highly, highly recommend that you be very truthful, as truthful as you can be to the insurance companies that you are dealing with for the home insurance. If you're going to rent out your basement and you say no, if, if the insurance company asks you, are you planning on renting out your basement? Does your basement have a separate entrance? Does your basement have a kitchen? And if you say no to the insurance company at that point, and in the future you do rent it out, for whatever sake, let's say that there is a fire in the basement and the, and the tenant was cooking and there is a fire in the basement and you have uh, not been honest to the insurance company, they are not going to cover the cost of the damage. So I would highly, highly recommend, I've seen, uh, I've seen several people sometimes lie to insurance company, which is not good uh, because insurance is for your best interest. If you want to get money out of insurance for any mishap that happens, you be truthful to them, right? It's like going to the doctor and not telling them what your actual pain is. Your doctor is going to give you the wrong medicine. Same way, there is no use in having a insurance and having a wrong insurance for, for your house, right? The next thing, next day that we are talking about is deaths. Uh, for some reason, I have seen a lot of people in, in Toronto get into debts. Not sure what the reason is, probably because they travel a lot back home. People love their vacations. I know for the last two years, none of us had have, have had any vacation, but I'm sure once things open up, it's going to be a, a disaster, a man-made disaster, right? But um, uh, debts... I have seen so many couples with heavy debts. One thing is you get into debt in this country, it's really very hard to get out of debt, right? But your property can probably be a blessing when you're in debt. Uh, there are different options available when you're in debt. Let's talk about the first one, which is refinancing your property, um, especially at this uh, uh, market condition. And at this time, the interest rates are very, very low. Refinancing your property is a great opp opportunity at this point because house prices are also selling at a very uh, high rate, right? You basically, uh, in refinancing, what happens is you try to apply uh, for your first mortgage plus your debts with another bank. You have the option of getting low interest rate. You can consolidate your debts. You can uh, change the mortgage terms. If there are some terms and conditions that you're not happy with your original mortgage, you can change them when you're refinancing. And the major thing is you can tap into your homes, uh, home equity. Um, that's, a, that's a very nice thing that's available for you when you refinance your property. Um, but also remember there are certain costs associated with the refinancing. Um, Aisha, you'll need to move to the next slide, please. So a uh, cost like appraisal fees, there will be an appraisal that happens when you're refinancing. Uh, legal fees will be borne by you. If there is any prepayment charges that needs to be done, if you switch lender, say you have your current mortgage with X bank and you move to Y bank, because you're switching your whole mortgage, you will have to pay the X bank something called as a discharge fee. Um, before you plan on refinancing your house, make sure that you call up the bank and find out what your discharge fee is if you're planning on changing the financial institution. Um, make sure that you remember that you need to account for all these charges as well when you're refinancing your property. The next thing that Next option that is available when you are in debt is called second mortgage. Um, 
normally what happens in second mortgage is it's different from your primary mortgage. In refinancing, you combine your debts with the mortgage. But in your second mortgage, you have your first mortgage with one lender, but you borrow money from, um, from, from a private lender. So what happens is if, if your mortgage right now is, uh, let's just throw a number, 500,000 with, uh, with one of the banks and you are in debt for about 100,000, right? And your property right now sells for, let's say 1 million, right? So you have that cushion, you have 500,000 as your mortgage balance, you are 100,000 in debt. So with a million dollar worth of uh, home, you can pay off that 100,000 mortgage, uh, 100,000 in debt, right? So you can borrow money from a second party, from a private lender who is willing to owe you the money and uh, the collateral will be your property that you are living in. Normally we need a collateral and that is, uh, that is always the property that you are living in. Um, it, it, the second mortgages normally have very high interest rates compared to your first mortgage. It's anywhere between 10 to 15%. Uh, people who normally go for second mortgage go with the idea because they want to repay it early or uh, sometimes people have very bad credits because of very high debt and they will not qualify for a mortgage with a bank. So people approach private lenders and get a second mortgage with a lien against their house, right? Once again, you need to have a decent amount of equity in your home. That's when a, a private lender can give you some, uh, can lend you some money. Um, once again, if it is any amount less than $50,000, you need only one lawyer who can put a lien on the house. If it's anything more than $50,000, then you need two lawyers to do your second mortgage. And all the cost is borne by the person who is borrowing the money, including um, including paying the lawyers on behalf of the lenders. It's the borrower who's, who pays all this amount. Uh, if you need any more information on second mortgage or if you would like a second mortgage uh, to pay off your debts, you can feel free to give me a call. We do have a lot of private lender contacts that we can arrange um, the loan for you. It does cost money. Um, when, when you are selling your home the way mortgages get paid is the first mortgage uh, bank gets paid first and your second mortgage uh, lender uh, gets paid second. When you're going for a second mortgage, you also need to add the second mortgage lender to your um, to your fire insurance, to your home insurance, because what if anything happens to your house that they have lent you the money on, they get compensated by the insurance company. So if you need any more information on second mortgage, just feel free to give me a call and I'll be more than happy to discuss. The next thing that we will touch upon is um, the next thing that happens when somebody is in debt is bankruptcy. Uh, pretty much bankruptcy is like pardoning from all the debts. It's given in good faith uh, because you have come to a certain level where it's become totally impossible for you to pay off any debt and you want to be pardoned and you want to start off fresh in life. That's when you declare bankruptcy. When, when somebody declares bankruptcy, it stays on their Equifax report, uh, on their credit report for next six years, right? Um, so when you're applying for bankruptcy, think a lot about it. Make sure that, um, because buying a home, once you have applied for bankruptcy is, is a little bit hard because as per lenders, you have no idea how to manage your money, right? So it becomes a little bit harder for you to buy a house. So when you're applying for bankruptcy, make sure that you think about it. The next thing that happens when somebody is in debt is a consumer proposal. The next slide, please. Uh, consumer proposal is very different from bankruptcy because in consumer proposal, it shows the intention that you want to pay. So the amount, uh, a part of the amount that you need to pay gets forgiven and the remaining part you need to pay it. Normally they divide that amount over a period of <clears throat> next five years. So within the next five years, you can pay off uh, anything when you, uh, any of those debts, when you declare consumer proposal. Once again, consumer proposal stays on your credit report for three years um, or six years from the date it was 
filed, whichever comes first. Again, when you have bankruptcy and consumer proposal, lenders have really strict rules about lending money for buying a home. So make sure that when you're declaring any of these things, you make a wise decision. The next thing we are going to discuss is default on mortgage. What happens when you default on mortgage, right? What is defaulting on mortgage? Basically, it means um, you have missed mortgage payments or you owe a lot in property tax. I know a lot of people, um, I actually, I know somebody who's uh, house needed property tax payment for almost five to six years right when 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 there is such a big uh, gap in paying the property tax then your home goes on default right and then if you do not have proper insurance on your property the mortgage company has rights um, to say that you are in default of the mortgage the next thing that we are going to discuss is uh, what happens when there is a default in mortgage uh, one thing that happens is foreclosure. Can we go to the next slide, please? When I normally work with buyer, I hear a lot of buyers saying, oh, do you have any homes on foreclosure? Do you have any homes on power of sale? So what do these terms mean? So one thing that power of sale, there is a difference between foreclosure and power of sale. We'll talk about the differences. So what foreclosure means is you miss a mortgage payment. The lender will send you your first reminder letter. You miss, um, you miss the payment again, or you don't, um, you or you haven't paid the same payment after the reminder letter. Then they send you something called as a demand letter, right? That gives you uh, your outstanding balance. Now, if you still fail to pay after the reminder letter, after the demand letter, ultimately what the bank does is they take over the property. So when the bank takes over the property, it's called foreclosure, right? Which means the bank has the title to the house. The bank can do anything with your house right now. Um, when it's a foreclosure, normally bank do not leave you that easily. They actually take you to the court. Um, they, they sell your property. Sometimes it's even below the market value and they add all the money that you owe to the bank to that amount. So pretty much if the property sells below the um, market value, then you will still owe as a, as, a, as a homeowner, you will still owe the bank some money. But if they do sell the uh, property higher than the market value, uh, which means the bank has made profit, the profit will not come to you as, as a owner, right? So what's the difference between foreclosure and power of sale? It's the exact opposite. In a power of sale, the bank does not take over the house, but they will force you to sell the house. Can we go to the next slide, please? So in, in a power of sale, the bank forces you to sell the house in Ontario, right? Because you have failed to pay the, the mortgage payment. And what happens in uh, power of sale is the, if you have not paid for many, many months, bank can actually ask you to vacate the property and they will put up the property on sale. I'm sure a lot of people have come through power of sale houses. Uh, Foreclosure and power of sale does not mean you will get property at half price, right? A lot of buyers come with this wrong notion. Oh, I'm looking for a power of sale house because I can buy it cheap. No, it does not work that way. Um, it's because the bank needs to recover whatever money that person who did not pay owes to them, right? So it's the mortgage plus the default amount. So power of sale or foreclosure does not mean you can buy a property for cheap. It's just, it, it, all it just means is that the bank needs to recover the amount that they need to recover, right? So it will um, most likely sell at a fa fair market value, right? And what happens in power of sale is, um, any profit that the bank makes, at least this is one good thing that happens, any profit that comes out of the house after payment of the mortgage, after the default, after all the expenses, if there is any money that is remaining, it goes to the homeowner, right? So at least they get some money in the power of sale. That's a big difference between a foreclosure and power of sale. Normally in a power of sale, you do not need to go to the court, but if uh, it's a, a foreclosure, you're taken to the court, right? <clears throat> 
And defaulting on mortgage does not stop only with power of sale or flow foreclosure. There is a lot of other serious consequences that happens. It depends from institution to institution, right? Now let's talk about the most hard to uh, digest, but it's one of, uh, it happens to everybody, right? It's just that we don't know when it's happening. Um, uh, uh, but but it happens, so we need to know what happens when someone dies. How does uh, what happens to real estate? How does property get divided when when uh, when somebody loses their loved ones? Um, so the property goes on uh, either a probate or a non-probate. We are going to look at what these terms are. They are very typical real estate terms. So we will. Ex I'll explain to you guys in detail what a probate means and what a non-probate means. And it depends on how the property title has been registered, right? Normally, uh, when one spouse dies and if they are married, it's very easy. The house just passes on to the other spouse. If it is something called as a joint tenancy, which means both of them live together in the same house, the house just gets passed on from one spouse to the other spouse. That's like pretty easy. But what happens if only one spouse is alive and, and they do not have any children? Or what happens when... Um, when, when uh, Let's talk about when, when somebody does not have a will, what happens? So basically a non-probate asset is something um, where I have already decided who my beneficiary is for my property, right? In that case, I don't need to go to the court, which means I have a will in place. When, when it's a non-probate asset, that person will have a will in place. They have written all the steps that one needs to follow if anything happens to them. So how does the property get divided? How, the, how does the money gets divided? So all those things are outlined in the will. That's a non-probate asset. This happens with somebody who's very, very well planned about their life. Um, if you own a lot of properties, if you have uh, a lot of uh, extra money at your disposal, um, I would always encourage that you go and write down your will. It de need not be anything very fancy. Um, in fact, the government of Ontario even considers handwritten wills. As long as they're able to match your handwriting um, with, with, with your signature or any, any other sources, you can even leave a handwritten will. What's a probate asset? So probate asset is pretty much when somebody dies all of a sudden, somebody dies of heart attack or, or, or something happens to them all of a sudden and they pass away, that's when you need to apply with the court for something called as a probate. So when you apply to the court for a probate, they normally check back to see who the beneficiaries are. You need to prove who the beneficiary is. Um, so it is basically a way to get all the um, deceased person's asset into the name of the beneficiary, right? And then it is up to the beneficiary what they want to do. There are many beneficiaries who, who want to sell the house. There are um, many beneficiaries who just keep the house as an asset or our or ancestral money. So it all depends on what the beneficiary wants to do at, uh, later on. But uh, when you have when you don't have a will in place, that's when people apply for a probate. Probate is a long process with the court. It normally takes about six months to a, to even a year to apply for a probate, right? So what happens when somebody dies without a will? So if someone dies without a will, if you have a spouse, but no children, your spouse gets your entire estate, right? If you have a spouse and you have children, the spouse will get the first 200,000 and the remainder gets divided equally among the children. If you don't have spouse, but you have children, what happens in that case? Then in that case, your estate gets divided equally between children. Uh, if any of your children is not alive at that point, it goes to your grandchildren. So if you don't have a spouse, if you don't have, a, have children, if you don't have grandchildren, which means you have lived a great life, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what happens in this case is your um, your equity or your property, everything gets divided between your parents. Um, if one one of your parent is alive, then it entirely becomes their estate. 
if you don't have children no um, no parents um, no siblings nobody then in that case it, it go if none of them are alive right it goes to this um, it goes to your nephews and nieces as their share right so this is what happens when uh, when when somebody goes through um, uh, go, go when somebody dies so th the easiest thing that i would recommend or or probably ask everybody to do is to write up your will like i said again it need not be a very fancy will you don't have to go to a lawyer to write your will it can just be on a plain sheet of paper in your handwriting detailing every asset that you have and who your beneficiary will be right be basically these are the um, main d's that i wanted to discuss in brief um, i hope I gave you some idea, so you're not struggling uh, when you're going through any of these Ds. Um, if you have any questions, if you have a specific situation, if you are going through any specific uh, thing in any of these Ds, you can feel free and give me a call and I'll be more than happy to assist. Uh, you can reach me at 416-888-9492 at any time. Thank you. Thanks, Aisha. Thank you so much. That was so... So like, you know, each time you come, you give so much education that uh, I go back and I, I have to go through it again. And I'm like, OK, let me put my things in order now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So there are a couple of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. The first question is uh, when you're talking about nat natural disaster, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, somebody asks, companies sometimes make it very difficult to get the insurance. Even uh -huh. though it has been mentioned on uh in the insurance document as one of the clauses they make it difficult especially when it comes to natural disasters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how do you deal with that <clears throat> you know what the best person would be to discuss with the insurance broker i'm not a uh, insurance okay. person uh i do not want to comment on the insurance side um but like i said um if you are honest with insurance company, I don't see why they will not release the funds. If there is anything that you have tried to hide or if there is anything that you have provided them that is not true, basically they are an insurance company. You know what their goal is. Their goal is not to make you rich or their goal is not to give you the money, right? They are going to dig deep into each and everything and find out how not to give you that money, right? I don't want to stress anything more. I would recommend you talk <laughs> to your insurance broker but then i would that's a, that's a very important and um, uh, important recommendation that i would say is don't lie to insurance company yeah. just think of them as your doctor and tell them the truth so true also i don't know if it pertains to you but somebody asked what is good debts when it comes to real estate what is good debts uh basically I would probably think of good debt as borrowing money to buy another house, right? A lot of people that I know do refinance house. I myself help, have helped a lot of people refinance house in the, in, in the last year because house values went up mm -hmm. and the mortgage that they owed on their, uh, their own house was very less. Um, so the, 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 you can borrow up to 80% of that value. Right, 20% of the equity you need to leave in your house. You can borrow up to 80% of that value. You can use it to finish your basement, or you can use it to do any home improvements that you want, or you can buy uh, buy another house using that money as a, as a down payment um, as, towards your next house, right? So I would believe these are some good debts um, because when you buy the next house, yeah. the mortgage gets paid by the tenants living there, right? So. So it doesn't come under refinancing or second mortgage? Uh, you can refinance. Banks do allow refinancing uh, to buy a second home. There are a lot of people that I know who have done that, especially okay. in this low interest rate. Okay. That, that's really nice to know. Okay. The third question, and uh, we, we could end with that, is like, why do you need two lawyers for the second mortgage? Uh, that's how it works because one lawyer does not represent when the amount is uh, 
anything above 50,000, um, you need two lawyers. The reason, I don't know why, because one lawyer represents the lender and one lawyer represents the borrower. But when it is um, 49,999, you need only one lawyer who represents okay. both the uh, borrower and the lender. And all these fees are paid by the borrower. Right. So uh, let's just take an example. If I'm 60,000 in debt, right? Um, normally, when you do a second mortgage, there is something called as a lender fee, plus you need to pay uh, uh, two lawyer fees in this case, because I'm 60,000 in debt. Uh, two lawyer fees is anywhere like 2000 to $2,500. And then the, the uh, lender fee is about 1%. Of the of the amount that you are borrowing, which means you need extra, let's say ten thousand dollars. So instead of borrowing sixty thousand, you would borrow seventy thousand because yes. that pays for all these things. And when you return, it would be seventy thousand, not sixty thousand. Yeah, yeah. So it is the rule of the mm -hmm. land and not your main rule. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> go ahead, have two lawyers and uh, look up the rules. Okay, thank you so much, Swapna. Again, like I said. We don't want to talk about these issues, but it is important that we do. Many people don't know how important it is to make their wills. Like you said, even if it is handwritten, it's important. Uh, I know I had, uh, 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 on my caseload, I had a client who said they don't have the will, but they remember their father saying that he had made the will. And then there was a fight among the, um, you know, uh, among the siblings. And they said it has to be equally divided. But in the will, the father has said it has to go to a particular person. Mm -hmm. So now they were looking for the will, but then the probate was happening. They couldn't find the will. So they were like, how can we prolong it? Is there any way that they can prolong it? Uh, when you have applied for a probate? <laughs> Once it goes to the court, it's in court's hand, right? Basically, yeah. court is the one who decides at that point how who would be the beneficiary to the properties. So yeah. once it goes to the court, once law takes it over, uh, there's hardly anything we can do. Yeah. What happens? You find the will after, you know, the property is being divided. Too bad, baby. Fight with <laughs> your siblings. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I, I actually send them to a lawyer. Hopefully it helped them. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's probably one good point. Make your will and keep it in a place that's accessible, right? Accessible, so, and, right. And let people know where the will is. Don't yeah. keep your will as a secret. Yeah, you know, sometimes it so happens you're keeping something so secretive, then you go to find it and you can't find the thing, right? You so, can keep information on the will secret, but don't keep the will itself <laughs> secret. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Okay, thank you so much, Swapna. No problem. Thank you. Thank pleasure. you so much. We are having a laugh and, you know, talking about these things which are important, but, at uh, you know, uh, in a lighthearted way. So thank you so much. And we appreciate you coming again and again on the platform. And no problem. My uh, pleasure. Thanks, Aisha. Thanks, Public Allies, for this opportunity. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. So thanks to all our viewers um, and have a good evening. We are going to see you again on the third with Jody Lynn. So stay tuned and take care of yourself. Bye.